Welcome everyone. My name is Carrie Sweeney. I'm the director of the UC Berkeley Retirement Center and I also serve on the Arohi Board and serve as chair of the Committee of Research and Education on the Arohi Board. And I'm pleased uh, to have you here today. And I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Perry Sinodo today. Uh, and just a second, I want to tell you a little bit about Arohi first and, um, and then we'll get to our talk. Um, and so Arohi is a nonprofit membership organization that promotes engagement of retired faculty and staff from nearly 100 institutions of higher education in U.S. and Canada. It educates by providing resources and tools to establish and maintain effective campus-based retirement organizations like yourselves. Our strength is our personal connection with our members to bring together colleagues through conferences, webinars, briefs, and discussion forums to network and learn. A couple of logistics today is to, um, if you have a question, we'll take questions at the end. You can mention that, um, put your questions in the chat. Um, and we are recording today's session, um, so you can access it later. And um, once um, Dr. Perry Sonoto speaks, uh, we'll break into small um, discussion groups with facilitators to answer a few questions that moderators have been, have been given and you'll be given to try to unpack perhaps how we can address some of these um, items from today's talk in our work as retirement organizations. So uh, Carlo Perry Sonoto, I know from when I worked at UCSF, uh, we were just counting the years nine years ago. Um, so much has um, grown and changed in the UC Division of Geriatrics since then. And we're so pleased to have her today. She's a leader in this field of uh, social isolation and loneliness. And um, she's a professor in the Division of Geriatrics at UC San Francisco. She's board certified in internal medicine, geriatrics and palliative medicine. She served as the Associate Chief for Geriatric Clinical Programs at UCSF from 2017 to 2021. And this role she oversaw developed uh, new clinical programs serving older adults across care settings. And for over a decade, she's worked in home-based primary care. More recently, she's begun work with VITUS, Hospice, Vetus, as the Associate Medical Director worked, working to rethink how we care for patients with terminal dementia. Dr. Perry Sonoda has gained national and international uh, recognition for her research on the effects of loneliness on the health of older adults. Her research and advocacy is focused on integration of loneliness assessments in healthcare and evaluation and implementation of community-based programs focused on ameliorating loneliness and isolation in older adults. Carla, Dr. Perry Sonoda, thank you so much for joining today. I'm going to hand things over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Carrie. And thanks for the lovely introduction. I was so happy to get an email from you. Um, so thanks. Thanks again for having me. Um, so I, I should also share, since I see so many UC people that I, I grew up in the UC system with my, um, my father being a UC Santa Barbara professor for over 40 years. And now I've been at UCSF since, um, since 2006. So many people in my community here. So we have a lot to go over. Um, and really, but I really hope it'll be uh, grounds for some great discussion when you all enter your small groups. Um, what our focus is on today broadly is how do we really think about connect, uh, creating social connections and what can retirement organizations do? I'm gonna focus really on first getting through some basic um, terms such as understanding what is the difference between loneliness and isolation and why are they actually public health concerns We'll talk about the evidence for the health um, effects, which is what my research has been for over a decade. And then we'll talk about some frameworks. How do we even think about uh, reducing loneliness and isolation and on the positive side, creating social connection. So if you're someone who follows the news, which sometimes feels hard to do because it often feels like it's just bad news all the time, you've probably seen a lot of things, whether in the news, in the print news or on TV, that there's a lot been written, written over the last decade and certainly more during the pandemic about, is there an epidemic of loneliness? How does loneliness affect our health? There's also some articles on social isolation. So what does this actually mean? Incredibly, just this last month in May, our own Surgeon General Vivek Murthy actually published an advisory 
saying that this, this really is a public health issue and emergency to think about the effects of loneliness and isolation our health, on our health and why social connection is so important. It's the culmination of decades and decades of research across the medical sciences, the social sciences, behavioral sciences, so it's pretty incredible. When I step back and look into my own life, you know, I started this work when I was a medical resident um, and I was really interested in thinking about the patients that I was seeing in my own practice, whether that be in the hospital or whether that was in clinics or at home. And I thought, God, some of my patients do better than others, even when they have the same medical conditions. And why is that? And I started to explore some of these topics around loneliness and, and lo and behold, um, it became really the topic that I've been researching um, since I was a young, young, youngish student. And then fast forward to having a daughter and I realized that there's things written about loneliness everywhere around me. This is a book that I had bought for my daughter unknowingly. And the book starts by asking, how are you feeling little fish? And the little fish says, I feel lonely. So what does it actually mean to be lonely and how do we actually put this in the context of social determinants of health? Well, I was trained as an anthropologist at Barnard in New York and then went on to public health school at Hopkins. And frankly, being an anthropologist and someone who practices public health, social determinants of health are not anything new. We've known for a long time that what goes into our health really matters. And unfortunately, what we see is that the bulk of healthcare dollars are actually spelt, spent on health care, yet that really only accounts for 20% of what goes into our overall health. And the other 80% are, so, are the social determinants of health, socioeconomic factors, the physical environment, health behaviors, and you can actually include social isolation and loneliness here. It's unfortunate that it's taken us to talk about it to these proportions to recognize that we need to rethink about how we conceptualize health, where our public health dollars are spent, and what we can do as organizations to preserve our health and social connection. What I can do is an individual clinician to really focus on what matters to my patients. So moving on, how do we actually define loneliness? Well, loneliness is subjective. So it is the feeling of being alone. Another way to think about it is that it is a distress that results from discrepancies between ideal and perceived relationships. So it's what you want, but you're not getting that. And why is that? And that leaves you feeling distressed. In contrast, isolation is about the complete or near complete lack of social contact, uh, contact in its extremes, but really more simply, it's about the quantifiable number of relationships or types of relationships. The reason why it's really important to highlight these two things is that when we think about the converse, which is forming social connections, we have to understand the basic principles of the negative sides of what is loneliness and isolation, because what we do for people will differ depending on what someone's experiencing. So again, loneliness is subjective, isolation is objective. With loneliness, there's a mismatch between the relationships, so it's about the quality of relationships. And then with isolation, it's about the quantity. I think an important thing to note about isolation is that it's not necessarily unpleasant. And for example, some people choose solitude. And so that's an important distinction as well. With loneliness, there's often a low sense of control or choice. If you put them on a spectrum in terms of how correlated are these, well, interestingly, um, there's actually very little correlation. The correlation coefficient between isolation and loneliness is pretty low at 0.2. So it means that these are related, but we can't, we can't assume that they are the same things. And we actually make a mistake by assuming they're the same and not focusing on the different aspects. As we'll talk more later on with Vivek Murphy's report, you'll also see that you know, on the negative side, it's social disconnection. On the positive, it's social connection. And there's also these components, emotional, functional, and structural factors as well. So I want to contextualize this a little bit further to have us think about what does this all mean um, in practice for me clinically, for you all as, as retirees or potential retirees or leaders of organizations and members of your community? So I'm a clinician at heart in addition to my research. So I think what, what got me into medicine continues to drive me is to really see people in person 
um, as much as possible. So I'll start with my first patient. His name is John. Um, he's 82. Well, he's now actually 85. Um, he became homebound in December of 2020. The reason he became homebound is that he got COVID and he fell. Um, he lives in San Francisco, and as if any of you are from San Francisco know, there's a lot of stairs here in people's homes. Um, and that really made him homebound is because he couldn't navigate the stairs anymore. He uh, lives in an ethnically marginalized and quote unquote unsafe neighborhood. He has family nearby. Interestingly, when I talk to him about the family, they actually li he, they live in the garage downstairs, but he really doesn't let me talk to them and they have no contact with me. So it's kind of this funny dynamic. Um, and then related to that, I think, is that he had been dismissed from many medical practices for inappropriate behavior. Um, and that was something that I didn't realize until I talk, took him into my practice, but realized very quickly <laughs> why he had been dismissed. He actually described himself as socially isolated, which I thought was interesting. In terms of tech connection, which was important because this was the middle of the pandemic, he had a landline and a basic cell phone and did not want to be bothered by any other technology, which made virtual care very impossible. The second gentleman is someone who I'm um, who I've cared for, whose name is Mel, who's 94 and he's dying of, of cancer. He's Jewish. He's also a re European refugee. He lives in an assisted living that caters to people of a different heritage than his own. He identifies as atheist, um, but some would describe him as a Holocaust survivor, although that's not often the language that he uses to describe himself, which is interesting. He doesn't really participate in activities that are available at the um, assisted living, but he enjoys and thrives on religious conversation. He's very hearing impaired, so has to use an external sound amplifier. English is a second language, even though he is fluent in English. And actually, when I first met him, he was requesting aid in dying. The third patient is Jana, who's two, two and a half years old. She was born during a pandemic. She was born in July of 2020. Initially, because of the factors of the pandemic in July 2020, when you, we knew very little, she had very limited social contact. Her parents decided to allow her to meet her family, extended family, and some friends to prioritize socialization. She is being raised in a bilingual and multicultural family. She's in daycare three times a week. She lives or goes to an intergenerational home uh, with her nanny twice a week. And then she recently visited friends and family in Italy. So if you think about these three different stories, they're on quite different trajectories in terms of their life. And one of the things we have to think about is if you're their family, if you're their friends, if you're their healthcare provider, if you're the leader of a health of, of a retirement organization that may cater to some of these folks, how do you really think about their health and how do you think about forming connections? So earlier this year, my colleague Julianne Holt Lundstad and I, um, Julianne is one of the premier and most well-known researchers and experts on the topic of loneliness and isolation globally. And we wanted to create a framework for clinicians, but really honestly for anyone in terms of how do we think about this topic? And we really thought about this framework of ear and of listening, which is the first step to really understanding social connection or conversely loneliness and isolation is educating. What is it? How does it affect our health? The second step is I need to assess it to make sure I actually know what I'm talking about and what I'm dealing with. And then the third part is respond. We were very deliberate about saying respond because in healthcare and as a physician, we tend to always think, oh, you have to refer, you have to do something, but that's not always true. Sometimes responding in different ways is what we do. And we'll talk more about that. So if we go through this framework, and think about the education, educate. So it's about estimating health risk. So I love this slide from the World Health Organization has been very vocal about ageism internationally and they are actually taking up the topics of loneliness and isolation this year as well. So you'll see more come out of the World Health Organization. But they talk about all the different factors that influence us as we get older at the individual level, but also in terms of the environment that surround us. What we're gonna focus on today primarily is really about behaviors and social facilities and the, and the social structures that surround us and that create us and how that impacts our health. So returning to our cases, if you were to look in John's medical record, what you might see in his medical record are things written such as he had COVID-19, he had arthritis, he has constipation, maybe 
sometimes someone will write that he's had falls. Geriatricians always write this, but often even the fact that he's had falls is, is, is neglected from the medical record. And I will tell you that certainly there's never anything written about social isolation, about potential loneliness, about mobility issues, technology access. And then there's this issue about inappropriate behavior and what does that mean and where does it get documented and how do we deal with it as neighbors, as friends, as colleagues, as healthcare providers. With Mel, who's nearing the end of life, we certainly know that he has cancer, he has limited mobility, hearing, which greatly affects his ability to connect with others, is often not written in the, in the medical record, even though it affects his health. And then the other things that are greatly neglected from the medical record in his story are the fact that he's socially isolated, he may be lonely, he has a living situation that has some positives and negatives, and there's not very much discussed or talked about the fact about his history of trauma, of being a refugee, and of being a Holocaust survivor. And then in the third story with Jana, as she's less than three years old, she has a lot of risk going on for her. She's unfortunately what's called a pandemic baby. She had limited exposure to infectious disease early on, and we really don't know what that means long term. She's a second generation American, which could be a risk or something that's protective. She's Latina. She lives in a quote unquote unsafe neighborhood. But then there's this idea of are there protective factors that we think about from a young age that we can carry on into adulthood and beyond living or participating in intergenerational activities. I saw someone on here with, with a young child, so I love that. Um, she's a second generation, as I, as I said, and what does it mean to prioritize social, socialization and connection early on? And can that be helpful to her lifespan? So going a little bit further until prevalence and risks and the health effects. So depending on what studies you read, and for those of you who are researchers, you know it all depends on the data, where it comes from and how it gets analyzed. But about a quarter of people are considered to be socially isolated in this country. Anywhere, you know, around 35% and over th those over age 45. In the study that I conducted in 2012, 43% of adults over the age of 60 reported feeling sometimes lonely. And in the UK, and this has been replicated in the United States, about 10% of the population is severely or chronically lonely, which means every day, all the time, feeling lonely. When we ask people during the pandemic what kinds of emotions people were experiencing, well, you see things like isolation at 41%, lonely 28%. Of course, there was the frustration, the stress. This was early in the pandemic, but you can see all these things and how they affected our health. Now, what are the risks for us? Well, I think a good framework is to think about losses. So losses predict or increase the risk of loneliness at the level in the, in, of the individual. And this is true of isolation as well. The death of spouses, the loss of relatives and friends, change in living arrangements, deteriorating physical health, change in your position in society, which can be through retirement, reduced social activity, sensory impairments such as loss of hearing and vision, and, and impairments in mobility. And then of course, it's important to note that the pandemic and COVID had significant effects on all of us. Now, what's important to know is that um, while the pandemic was a huge impact for all of this, these trends have been existing and going on for much longer. In this study that looked at, it's a time use study that looked at how, how people are engaging um, in different types of activity, when you look at the trends since 2003, and this is actually echoed and started earlier when Robert Putnam wrote his book, Bowling Alone, what you see is that there's been 24 hours per month increase in social isolation. You've seen that even hours of family social engagement has decreased, companionship has decreased, social engagement with others non-household family contact has decreased, social engagement with friends. I mean, this is, look at the social engagement with friends, which is the bottom left part of this graph, a decrease in 20 hours per month. I feel like I, so I'm 40, how old am I? I'm 44, I'll be 45 this summer. And I see this in my own life. I see this um, in terms of when I was raised and how frequently my parents had dinner parties where actually we had a lot of department events with my dad's department at UC Santa Barbara and how that has changed over time. I see in my own cohort of friends, 
I mean, getting together with anyone, it's like impossible. It's like call my assistant and match something on my calendar. It's a little bit ridiculous to just this casual, let's to get together for coffee or drinks, or even now I'm sitting in my office at UCSF right now, and I'm the only one here. And so it, it's, it's understandable that there's all these structures around us that have changed in terms of what is, how are we valuing social connection? One of my favorite poets, Ruby Cower writes, the irony of loneliness is we all feel it at the same time together. And I think this is really true and sad, frankly. I don't wanna highlight, I, I'm a little bit um, tired of speaking about COVID, but I think it is not. it should not be a surprise to all of us that this had a dramatic effect on all of us at all ages of all genders, of all ethnic and racial backgrounds. The magnitude of it really varies. There are certainly some cohorts and some groups of people that were affected more, more than others. It was not universal that everyone did worse, but I think that we, we can agree on that this had an effect and it highlighted some of the issues that we have in terms of how connected or disconnected we are, are we? So to bring it back to what my original research was in 2012, so over a decade ago. So I wanna highlight the fact that I was not the first person to study this. Okay, what was different about my research is that the majority of research on loneliness and isolation was being published in social science journals. And so my paper was the first to be published in a medical journal that fortunately or unfortunately really brought this topic to the line, limelight from a health perspective and saying, hey, this is not something we can ignore. But listen, fast forward, you know, 11 years later is when we have finally a Surgeon General Advisory here in the United States. Several years ago, the United Kingdom and Japan appointed a minister of loneliness, for example, to say this has dramatic effects on our people in terms of quality of life, but also healthcare dollars and expenditures um, and ultimately mortality. So my study was a large nationally representative study, something called the health and retirement study. So we did a secondary data analysis. It was about 1600 adults over the age of 60 that were followed for six years. We asked if they were lonely using something called the UCLA loneliness scale. For those of you from UCLA, it was developed there. It's three questions and we, asked, and we classified lonely, people as lonely if they reported um, feeling lonely some of the time to any of the questions. What I was interested in as a geriatrician was of course death and also decline in functions. And so many of the patients that I was seeing in my clinics really wanted to talk about how do I maintain my independence as long as possible. And what did we found? Well, we found that loneliness was common, as I said, about 43% of older adults in my sample or adults over the age of 60, excuse me, reported loneliness. It was an independent predictor of functional decline with a 59% increased risk of functional decline and an independent predictor of death and a 45% increased risk. And this was really the beginning of my work and realized, oh my goodness, this is just the start. I have so much to learn. And so do all of us as members of this community. What has happened since then? Well, the studies just keep growing and growing. You know, it used to be pretty hard to get anything published on, on loneliness. Now you just see a plethora of papers on this. Andrew Steptoes is also one of the greatest researchers. And in 2013, he conducted a study, again, repeated it in 2020, looking at both men and women, um, followed them for seven years and determined that there was higher all-cause all mortality then also sub, um, segmented down to cardiovascular mortality and seeing that it was higher in people that had experienced both loneliness and isolation. So we continue to see that. And this is just a snapshot of the research, but I wanted to share some of it. In 2021, there was a fascinating paper looking at um, isolation and disability burden after people have been in the intensive care unit. And what this paper showed and about a thousand um, people admitted to the intensive care unit is that for each point increase, for each point that someone was more socially isolated, you saw an increase in disability and an increase in mortality. So again, if you think about it, and I think about how I was trained in my time working in an intensive care unit, we never talked about whether people were socially isolated and what their social support structures were. We never talked about whether someone was lonely. I saw it. And I hypothesized about whether it had an effect, but it wasn't talked about. If I move a little bit further into my work in hospice and uh, working with people with serious illness, my amazing colleague, Ashwin Kotwal, uh, one of my colleagues in the division of geriatrics, is a palliative uh, medicine physician as well. 
looked at in the last six months of life, 79%, nearly four in five adults are lonely and social isolation doubles in the last six months of life. So think about as we're nearing this very vulnerable point, we're alone or we're feeling alone and that's a hard place to be. What does this also mean for those of us with serious illness or just as we get older? Well, we know that lonely older adults experience higher rates of pain, anxiety, depression, insomnia. What does this lead to? Unfortunately, polypharmacy. When I see older adults as a consult or in practice, so many of my patients are like, oh my God, I'm taking way too many medications. And I honestly think, and this is more work to be done, that very often some of the related factors like loneliness and isolation are not being addressed and they're being treated inappropriately. And that leads to polypharmacy and it leads to other health complications. How does this, you know, how does this ultimately affect us? Social isolation, we think, um, you know, you don't get the benefits, the positive parts of social life um, of, about uh, connecting. But there's also this, this challenge with if you don't have sources of support, whether it's financial, medical, having caregiver or, or emotional support, that has a negative impact on our health. My colleague, Julianne Holt Luntz, out again, her, one of her landmark papers, which the Surgeon General quotes is saying, is reminding us that not being connected is as bad as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Okay, this is not insignificant. The summary, and this is just, a, again, a brief summary, is that we know that this connection, whether it's loneliness and our isolation in different degrees, can worsen our heart disease, worsen our control of diabetes, lead to poor sleep and depression, although it's bidirectional, higher frailty and functional decline, higher healthcare dollars by $6 billion and in increased mortality. Why else do we think this happened? Well, with loneliness, as you remember when I started earlier, loneliness is distressing. If it's distressing, the thought is that that leads to an increased stress response. We have all these stress molecules, chemicals in our body that have effect on our different organ systems. So it's a wear and tear, this constant tear down on our, on our bodies. And then you add in the social isolation piece also, and there's a, a difference in health behaviors and the receipt of medical care. So if we return to our three cases, you know, at the top, number three, this is Gianna, our two and a half year old, which I hope she's at full performance and at the beginning of her lifespan. And the question that we have is how do we support someone like her so she stays in this top part of this graph of being at full performance and independent as long as possible? If I think about John, who became um, isolated during COVID and homebound, he's moved from being in full performance and heading into frailty. And can we change the trajectory of his life course by really focusing on social connection? And then with Mel, who's nearing the end of life, I don't know that we can change his life course at this point because of where he is. But there is this question of, is, can we change his quality of life so that the last ones that he does have are spent feeling connected? So how else do we translate this into practice and how do we meet the needs of clinical um, adults? Uh, uh, how do we meet the needs of older adults? And what is your role as people who either work for retirement organizations or members of or are interested in this topic period? Well, um, again, interestingly, where does this want to go? Okay, there. Um, in 2020, in February, the National Academy of Sciences published a report. I was one of the Academy members um, for this report saying, uh, titled Social Isolation and Loneliness in Older Adults, Opportunities for the Healthcare System. Well, that what this rep uh, report did is review all the vet evidence and concluded the following. We need an evidence base, not on the health effects because that's there, but what we do about it. We need to translate uh, research into healthcare practices. We need to improve awareness, strengthen education and training, and then strengthen ties between our healthcare system and our community-based networks. So part of this also um, is about assessing and measuring and understanding who's at risk. So interestingly, um, a couple of years ago, when I gave a talk at a, a large um, continuous uh, living organization uh, in Wisconsin, I asked the people in the audience if they had ever discussed loneliness with their healthcare providers or if they've ever been asked. Well, over 50% of the participants in both said they'd never been asked about it and they don't talk about it. 
this is my informal study with no control, but this has actually been replicated in some of the literature as well, that this is not something we're talking about in, in, talking about in healthcare. I think with the pandemic, things are starting to change a little bit. And I've seen that in my practice. And I've been really pleasantly surprised to be with medical students or residents who, who will present patients to me and will say, you know, I think they're experiencing isolation. I'm like, oh my God, the times are changing. Thank the Lord. We're in, we're in a good path to really think about health holistically. I mentioned earlier the UCLA loneliness scale. It's three questions. Do you feel left out? Do you feel isolated? And do you lack companionship? What's nice about this question is that it can actually be used in primary care settings. I think it also can be used for programs to really evaluate, is their program targeting isolation? Is it making an impact or not? I did not bring up the questionnaires on isolation because they're more complicated and there's a lot more debate about which is the right scale to use, but I wanted to at least start here. So how do we again translate this into practice? Well, I'll, I'll tell you from a clinical approach, there's a couple ways I think about this and this is the framework. So I'm gonna start with B, which is the indirect interventions. So there are times what I have seen in my own practice that someone has vision and hearing impairment and it is amazing that addressing someone's hearing. I just saw someone yesterday actually, who um, her family was having a hard time communicating with her and I gave her an external um, sound amplifier and it was you know, drastic improvement to her, her being able to communicate with her family. So that's sometimes what's a huge impact that in addressing stairs in the home or mobility limitations. But a bulk of what we'll be talking about here is more direct interventions and really thinking about what you all can do as, as organizations working with retired people is how do we think about social support? How do we think about enhancing interactions? And how do we adapt this maladaptive cognition, which is also, for example, my patient, John, has been dismissed from, from practices. What's going on there with how he relates to people that that may be something we need to address for him to actually be able to connect with others. In the Surgeon General's report, I think really important, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is that he talks about there's three vital components of social connection. It's the structure, which is thinking about what is the number and variety in relationships that you have, that people have, and what are the frequency of interactions? So you can think about with your organizations, um, you know, it may be that household size and friend circle size and marital status, maybe you can't impact that directly, but can you impact when you create programs for your members or how often you meet and in what, in what settings do you meet? The second part is function. So there are different types of relationships that may be emotional support, it may be mentorship, it may be support in a crisis. I certainly know as I've grown in my career, I love my mentors and those that I know have so much more experience than I have that I can turn to and say, hey, how did you get through this as you, when you were you know, a younger professor like me? How did you balance being a parent and being um, an academician? And then there's the third part, which is the quality, which is both the positive and negative aspects of relationships. So this is about how satisfied are you with relationships? Or is there a relationship strain? Is there social inclusion or exclusion, which I think is incredibly important to some of our marginalized groups, whether that be marginalized by race and ethnicity, whether it be marginalized by gender, because, or, um, um, because we know that those are huge risk factors for loneliness and isolation. So some of the direct um, things that we can do, so social cognitive training, which is we think about my patient who is difficult, you know, who says, and he, whether he says he's lonely or isolated, how do we address that? At the beginning of this talk, I showed the little book from my daughter and the fish said lonely, but then the fish says, but then I remember that I'm loved. And the book then tells, you know, tells you to say, what are ways to show someone that you love them? So this is, you know, I, I show this because it's amazing that sometimes we make these really complex and it's not always that complex. And we forget to do basic things like saying hi to people and connecting with people every day. So moving from the simple, we go to the little bit more to the complex, which is again, returning to the Surgeon General's report. The Surgeon General really talks about the different factors that can shape social connection at the individual level, at the relationship level, at the community level, and the society level. And I love this approach because I think it's really important to reduce some of the stigma and say, well, if you're lonely, that's your fault. Those are your individual factors. Well, no, there may be some individual factors, but there's a lot of things that can happen at the relationship level, 
community level and societal level. I think at the societal level and returning to the World Health Organization document, um, there's a lot of ageism in this country and worldwide, and that affects how we feel valued, our place, and our places created for older adults with different abilities to connect. I think the other part of society, which is important is civic engagement, which is why I would love that Carrie invited to give this talk because it's really about how do you continue to ma maintain connections as we get older and as our work roles change as we get older. A little bit more about some evidence that we have about programs here. So this is around social access and increasing social support. So in some categories of things that have been looked at, volunteering. So interestingly, there's some pre pretty decent data on volunteering. Linda Freed, phenomenal uh, geriatrician and researcher, who's um, also the Dean of Public Health at Columbia, um, developed a program called Experience Corps, right? I think what's important about volunteering is knowing that the research, what it supports is that it's something that's longitudinal, that it's not just a one-time thing, that it's really something you maintain over time. Why? I think there's some things there about the building of relationships and purpose. Group activities, I think there's emerging data here. It's a little bit mixed. They're hard things to study. I think it's hard in terms of whether you think about um, being a researcher pragmatically or um, how you conceptualize, but these are hard things to study, but nonetheless, they're important. So choral singing, church attendance, or I would say religious um, um, and spiritual activities, regardless of calling it a church are important, but it depends on whether you feel welcomed in that community. Intergenerational program, fascinating stuff here. One of my colleagues um, at Harvard, has this work on a lot of work on the importance of the arts and creative expression for addressing loneliness. And then I wanted to share this report. So this is from McKinsey. I think that I, I will I will start by saying that there's, I think, a little bit problems with the met methodology of their of their study and their report. But I think what I wanted to highlight here is that um, McKinsey sampled a whole bunch of people with internet access across the globe. So that creates some biases in terms of who has internet access. But some of the important things that older adults identified in terms of what's important to individual health is sense of purpose. And we're seeing this played out a little bit more in the research in terms of purpose being directly related to health, purpose also being a mediator and a factor affecting loneliness and social connection. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and I think that's something that I wonder about you know, is that a place where retirement organizations play in in terms of how do you maintain a sense of connection and purpose? Going back to another book, can you believe it? There's a second book that my daughter had on, on loneliness. And the little fish says, sometimes I feel lonely, but other times I feel like holding hands with a friend. I think this is interesting. It's about, it's not about being all or none, but sometimes there's room for both in terms of how do you remember to make social connections? I had the pleasure of working with um, an amazing program here in San Francisco called the Curry Senior Center um, that serves uh, uh, um, adults in the tenderloin, which in the tenderloin, we see a lot of premature aging, unfortunately, because of concurrent substance use at times or histories of trauma and hi histories of mental health challenges. And what we found with this peer program, which is really just peers connecting with peers, is that we saw decreases in loneliness over one year period, decreases in depression, anxiety, and decreases in barriers to connecting socially. So this tells me that I think there's a lot of answers already going on in our communities. We just haven't spent the time and the effort to study them and recognize what are the effects, how can we replicate, and how can we scale. A couple other examples are telephone support programs, which can be really helpful in a crisis. They can also be helpful for people with, with who don't have good connections in their own community or families or don't feel comfortable, that, which could get at the quality of relationships. I'm going to, I think in this interest of time, just skip um, more details on the friendship line, but I think I will say that what's fascinating about the friendship line and some of these phone support programs, it's really about supporting, finding supportive connections, having staff who are trained specifically in knowledge around aging and disability, and that creates space without judgment. There are so many different programs in our communities. I think a lot of this is turning to what are our own communities doing? Are there religious communities? And then here you all are, or one example is the Berkeley Retirement Center and many of you who have your organizations at your own institutions is what, what are you doing? And how can you think about using these frameworks to support yourselves 
and your other communities to stay connected so we can preserve our health. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about tech since I live in San Francisco and we're the middle of Silicon Valley where that's all everyone wants to talk about. I get emails every day, which is that there's an app for this, there's an app for that. There may be some roles of it, but I think this busy slide, I think sums up a lot of the research. This is by Louise Hockley, one of the most well-known researchers and my friend and colleague um, out of Newark, the University of Chicago. What this study tells us really is that she compared the different types of contact, what's in person, what's by phone, what's about messaging, what's about video. And the idea here is that while some of these technologies, phone, messaging, video can mitigate some of the effects of loneliness, it is not a replacement for in-person interaction. And I think that's a really important take home message. That does not mean that there's not a role for technology, there is but it's all about the intent. How are we using it? And is there a replacement? As we're nearing the end here, you may have heard some talks about social prescribing. Social prescribing is this idea that, as we mentioned, social determinants of health and what we do outside of our healthcare actually matters for our health. Now, the challenge right now is that it's kind of just a, um, you know, it's a catchy term, but we don't actually know what that means. I will tell you kind of practically for me, it means that when I do see patients, I do talk about the importance of social connection and I talk about their other health risks. I'll talk about the blood pressure and blah, 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 all the things I have to do. But then a lot of it really is about this is important for health. I have to think about as a clinician, who am I focus on? Which are my patients that are greatest risks? What am I worried about in that person? Is it the loss of independence? Is it loss of cognition? Is it about death? Or is it about preserving health and cognition? How long do we have to treat, treat someone or address social connection? We don't really know. I think we know that social connection is positive. That's very clear. But exactly in what quantity, this is something we're really trying to understand. What do we do when the evidence is limited? So I think there's strategies for individuals that we, we may do individually for ourselves. And then there's certainly at the population level and what you all may be doing in your retirement um, uh, organizations. So that the key parts about are about individualizing what you're doing, talking about it, the talking about the prevalence and the risk factors about loneliness and isolation and the importance of social connection conversely, and then thinking creatively about what may work for me may not work for someone else. The Surgeon General concludes by giving six pillars to advance social connection. Strengthening local social infrastructure. I think that's a lot about what you all are doing in your communities and how do you scale what you're doing? How do you replicate in other universities? How do you encourage other universities to create programs? How do you enact pro-connection policies? How do we mobilize the healthcare sector, which is why I love the work that I do in the healthcare sector? How do we reform digital environments? So right after he published this advisory, he published another one on the risks of um, social media on young kids. How do we deepen our knowledge on the topic? And how do we build a culture of connection, which I think number six to me is really the long haul focus that we have to do. With that, I will say that I work with the Foundation for Social Connection, who's working nationally on our national strategy alongside the journal, Surgeon General. It's thinking about, should our health insurance be supporting our social needs? We're starting to see some payers think about this, but I don't know to what extent. Ensuring that older adults are at the table in some of these discussions in terms of who is designing and what is being designed. The number of tech companies that are run by young people that really don't ask older adults what they want is really fascinating. Fascinating is a kind word. <laughs> um, and then, of course, discussing ethics and privacy. So revisiting our cases. Um, with our first case with John, who became socially isolated with the pandemic, I think our question is, is, is addressing structural environment and systemic racism the answer, given that he's living in a very ethnically marginalized neighborhood? If we address the stairs, would that help him at least get out? Of course, there's the bigger issue of his maladaptive social cognition and that he's a toxic person. Interestingly, he has some insight into call his own health plan and say, I need some mental health help. But when he called, they said, well, you don't have a diagnosis, so we can't see you, which I thought was completely ridiculous. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. With Mal, who's um, at the terminal stage of his life, 
you know, I think the question is in addressing his religious identity and his trauma, something that's going to be helpful to feel more connected at the end of life. And I'm not sure. I think that's what I'm currently actually working on with him. And in the third case, if you haven't noticed, this is my daughter, Gianna. She'll be three next month. So she's a little bit over two and a half. But my question is, is what can I do as her parent to change her life course? And how do I invest in the policy and the social structures in our country and internationally so that she can have a more fruitful life? So in summary, um, I'm hoping we define social isolation and loneliness. Um, we talked a little bit about how loneliness and isolation are linked to different health outcomes, including serious illness. And I talked a little bit about the effects of the pandemic, but wanted to not spend too much time on that. I hope I helped you to create a framework for understanding how we think about interventions and solutions. I talked about a few evidence-based solutions. We're connecting with each other here and you're about to connect in your small groups. And I purposely did not give you all the answers so you guys can think creatively about your context and what might work for you. And this was in front of the Trevi Fountain in Rome in January, my husband, my daughter, and me. And we got to go with my mom, so nice intergenerational trip, and got to see some of our extended family in Italy. And it was actually my first trip back to Italy, as well as my mom, since my father died. My dad's from Italy. And so we got to really connect with all our extended family there. So I will stop there. And that's it. Uh, thanks, Carla. Wow. Um, thank you for helping break it down um, in ways that we can think about it creatively and critically. And we have a couple questions in the um, chat, and I'm going to be looking at an external screen here so I can see the font, which my eyes are starting to, I should have got around my glasses. So um, one person just made a suggestion. Um, uh, he's, I think he might be still on the, might have left early. Michael Rainey asked about uh uh, scam fear, whether or not it would be worth measuring and research that it, being scared of it, uh, yeah, scam fear. So, and how that compounds loneliness. I, and I, I, I think that's so huge. I mean, I think, um, so it, it's interesting. There's scam fear. There's a couple things to go through here. I haven't done a lot of work in this area, but a great recommendation. What's interesting is that we know from some research out of UCSC, a USC, that cognitive impairment um, is greatly, so being susceptible to scams is actually a very indica early indicator of, of developing cognitive impairment, but it's really hard because often you end up being more lonely or isolated because you're afraid of scams and so don't answer your phone. But that being said, like I tell my mom all the time to not pick up the phone because she has been the victim of scams and that's been really hard. Um, so yes, I am actually going to write this down because I have such a great research community that I love thinking about additional venues for this. So thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for that. Um, the other one is about, um, I don't know if it's particularly a, a question. So my PCP must mm -hmm. ask about pain and mental health. Here's yet another set of questions about loneliness. Is there a review of the burden on healthcare providers? Uh, what would be the treatment plan that overstretched healthcare providers would refer if community doesn't have programs in place? Yeah, so really, really great question. There is some research here. And if, if some of the work does uh, done, not specifically on loneliness and isolation, but if you look at all the things that we or I have to do as a primary care provider, I need like 40 hours in a day <laughs> to actually get it all done. I think the argument here is that we are actually spending a lot of time on asking about things that actually have less impact on our health. And we're not focusing on the things that may matter to our patients and that have a greater impact on our health. So for example, I'm not saying to not ask about smoking, but if you look at the risk of isolation and smoking being similar, why are we obligated to ask about smoking, but we're ignoring social connection that's starting to change. I think that's why this conversation is much bigger and why our work at the policy level and nationally is so important because um, we need to think about who asks these questions, how do we do them, and how do we um, ensure that we get value in the healthcare we're receiving. Um, I think in terms of the treatment plan, this is where the social prescribing piece, this is where the evidence is emerging. And I think we have to remember that it's not always, actually, for me as a geriatrician, often I do more harm by over-referring, but it's more about having a conversation. And I actually believe that sometimes, and I've seen in my own practice by talking to someone about, well, what do you think should happen? It's not about me saying, go do this program. I mean, early on 10 years ago, when I started this, I had a patient that told me, you know, I just miss working in retail. <laughs> so like that wasn't in my like laundry list of things to recommend as a solution, but that's what worked for her. She started volunteering at the Salvation Army store and like was so happy. <laughs> and I'm like, 
I couldn't come up with that. And so I think that's why it's not always just referring to something or someone, but it's about Carrie, what is valuable and important to you? And how can we help you do that? When we don't have that, then we can think about community-based programs and things that may match when people don't know where to even start. Yeah, I don't think we ask that to people enough, just in general and our doctors, right, as well. It's a, it's a very simple question and it can really go a long way. Um, someone may feel lonely uh, or isolated in the midst of others. So Diane has asked, how do we create real connections and not just occasions and activities? Man, I'm going to leave that one for you guys talking to your small groups. But I will say that I think this really gets back to our social structures and if you're a fan or if you've ever uh, read any of Brene Brown's work, I think it's amazing what she talks about being vulnerable and open. And I have found that I think there's some positive parts from the pandemic is that there's more openness to talking about um, a, a talking about loneliness in our own experience. You know what I forgot to share, Carrie, and I wonder yeah. if I, before you all go, I'll put, there's... Um, sure. There was actually a documentary that I was in. Um, this is not about self-gloating, but it's a really beautiful worldwide vi uh, um, view on loneliness and isolation, what different people are doing about it. So I'm going to share that as well. And I think there's a really important thing about forming real connections. Um, we'll put it in the chat. And I've been taking notes on the link to the Surgeon General's report on pocket talkers, which I learned about in geri the geriatrics division, which not enough people know about for amplifying yep. hearing and um, also the McKinsey report and et cetera. So we'll, we can send that out following this. Um, so Kay, uh, Dr. Jeter, thank you. I'm pleased to say that Arohi has thought of this issue um, of using the wisdom of retired professionals and HBCUs, uh, which Dr. Jeter is focusing on to gather as a virtual community to address, among other things, the issues of loneliness. This combined research and the use of groups of highly educated minorities to contribute to the knowledge for our minority communities, our proposal was not funded, but it showed the organization was trying to make a difference in this area. So that's a comment. And thank you, Kay. Annalise has uh, said, thank you for a great informative talk. My question, retirement organizations are slow post COVID to return to in-person or hybrid events. Yes, Annalise, I've noticed that too. So I was hoping this event could spur some conversation. Are the organization constraint, organizational constraints that influence this, are there organizational constraints? If so, how can they be addressed? And we could talk about that in our groups. Any thoughts on that, um, Carla, that organizational uh, restraints? Well, um, you know, I think the organizational strains other than finances are starting to be less. I think, you know, frankly, some of those restraints we had before, such as space, are now gone since no one's here at <laughs> campuses. So it's like amazing. There's suddenly all these open conference rooms that you could never find. I think there's unfortunately still some fear around some older adults about being around other people. And I, that's part of my role as a physician is to educate and say like, hey, like we're in a good place right now and we really need to prioritize our social health. Um, but I, and I think creating room for both is really awesome for both in-person and, and virtual. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, uh, this is Doug Jones asked, uh, with COVID many interactions became online only as much as programs as Zoom provide wider access, which are a benefit uh, for those who are not able to attend some activities in person. For some who are Zoomed out, and for organizations considering opportunities for interactions with its membership, is it time to combine the advantage of online with those of in-person to create yeah. hybrid? We talk about that a lot and it's gonna take some resources on our small centers to make it happen, but the technology is coming along like gangbusters. So I think it is possible. Plus, if we offer a hybrid nine times out of 10, 75 percent of the people will stay and we've, you know, we've it's hard to plan that way. But uh, but it does I agree that, that hybrid. Any thoughts on the hybrid connections? Uh, I think, or? again, I think it's really I think one of the things that's really important and it was why, you know, I showed this lie about tech is that in person still trumps other things. But there are times where the increased access for people that have mobility limitations who are still afraid to go out or whatever, it's huge. And I, we've seen increased participation. I know personally for me, going to professional um, meetings virtually are just awful and I don't want to go. And so I just would rather go in person providing they're in an awesome city. Um, but I think there's, there's room for both here. And I think we just need to really move on. And I'm hoping that that's partly what the Surgeon General Report does. Um, 
I will, um, two points. Someone said something about pets. I don't want to uh, trump yeah, you, no, Carrie. No, go for pets, it. We'll pets are interesting, okay? okay. Pets provide companionship and can ameliorate some but it also creates barriers. And so it's a mixed bag. And interestingly, like of the limited studies, like dogs are, dogs are better than cats. I don't want to make judgment call for anyone who's a cat person here, but there's some different things here. So um, there are some positives there, but it's not as black and white as you would, you would think. I also saw someone ask a question about a survey. I think that's a great idea. Um, Carrie can sure, certainly share my email. And I would say this is some of the work that nationally with our Foundation for Social Connection, we're really trying to think about what are we missing and how else can we help? So we welcome partners and ideas to be, um, you know, really move the needle forward, or, forward here because we all have blind spots um, and we all have new ways to think about it. So um, I welcome all of your um, expertise here, I imagine. That's great. Um, I love that. Yeah, you, you see, if you see comments here, you know we can take it on. I, I, Anne is asking about hybrid uh, for all, um, and the number of people attending in person is gradually increasing. So yeah, we need to keep at it. Anne, you're right. Um, I love that we can help people with disabilities to attend uh, that would have otherwise not attended. And I would imagine hearing loss is very isolating. Anna says, yes. Very, very. And there's a lot of evidence around that. And it's actually incredibly, it's something that's ignored a lot. I think the fact that Medicare changed some of, or that what they did um, is make uh, hearing aids over the counter is a huge step in the right direction. There's still cost barriers and other things, um, which is why I often use the lower cost pocket tuckers. I just put in the chat, it should be the right link, which is this, um, uh, which is the loneliness documentary, which is streamed for free this week since it's Global Loneliness oh. Awareness Week. That's did we plan great. this well, Carrie? We did, didn't we? <laughs> I know, I was happy to so. see that it really lined up. Mm -hmm. um, any other um, questions? This has just been really insightful and given us a lot of really good context to have our conversations. I think if I'll take one more from Jim and then I'll, I'll share the questions with folks so that we can break into our groups. Um, Dr. P, are you familiar with the part uh, prescription America? Yep. What do you think? You know, I, um, I just learned about this. I think it was at ASA at the American Society on Aging Conference. So, I mean, this is the type of thing that is just so awesome to see us pushing. So um, yes, I'm vaguely familiar and I'm just excited to see some of these different things come out. So thank you for reminding me. See, cool. I learned something. I've got, I have to take oh, my I own notes here. Telling you, so. it's being connected to some of the smartest people in the world. So I, I uh, have a really great group here. Um, we really appreciate your time today in helping us. I'm hoping this will really kick off some healthy and deep conversations about how we can really be conscious about moving things forward, especially after COVID, um, just getting over that hump. Some of it will be natural, but I think some of it really needs to be um, some concerted pinpointing of looking at understanding loneliness and social isolation. So Carrie, um, can I just answer this last question? I see yeah. the impact of short-term yeah. memory loss. Yeah. Um, this is, and I, we, this is probably a huge topic in and of itself. And it's actually something that the CDC is taking on in terms of the effects of cognitive health and loneliness and isolation bi-directional. Um, and I think bigger topic, but I don't want to ignore that um, in that Again, loneliness and isolation, big risk factor for, uh, for cognitive decline. But certainly if there is some even mild memory loss, there's, there's a couple of things there that are, that are worrisome. Um, one for the individual and for the caregiver, because there can be a lot of isolation for the caregiver of someone living with memory loss. I don't think that, um, that this means that we don't have programs. I think it's about being creative again and creating, um, I mean, it's a little, I feel a little, she, I don't know what the right term is saying, um, ageism and our view of aging is so at the root of so many of these things and creating space for people with different abilities. is just really important. So uh, it's, it's so true. Um, and the more we can talk about and normalize these, uh, I, I think is the, it was part of the key. So that education yeah. piece, I think we'll have a lot of work to do in that pillar and that part of it, um, uh, being able making those social connections, but helping raise awareness of it. Um, and I would had a question just to, um, about
about the shame wrapped around it. How do we make sure that we are approaching, what are some tactics for approaching the conversation where we can avoid, you know, soften that feeling of shame around this topic? Well, I think that that's actually why the Surgeon General's report coming out is so important because I think it normalizes in terms of saying like, you're not alone, that this is actually very prevalent. And sometimes in terms of self-disclosure about our own experience, I mean, I, I would doubt if, if someone said, I've never had an ounce of loneliness at any point in my life, um, because I think loneliness or the feeling of connecting and belonging is so central to being human that, um, it, you know, I think most people at some point experience even an ounce at some point. Um, but I think just opening about it in terms of saying like, listen, this is a, there's a lot of factors that are outside of the individual that are impacting us. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's, that's removing, removing the blame or that, that it's someone's fault is a huge part of this. Great. Well, we're ready to break. We're, we're ready to go. I think to break into breakout groups and, um, we, ha we know where to find you and, uh, um, I can uh, connect with you on these topics and just really appreciate your, thank you so much, Carla, for your work on this and for being here today for us and stimulating us around this important topic. And, um,